With the signing of the Washington Naval Treaty, battleship construction in the U.S. was effectively halted for 15 years. The result was that like every other country, the U.S. switched to building 10,000 ton 8-inch gun cruisers, the maximum allowed by the treaty. The first of these was the Pensacola class. Originally designated light cruisers because of their thin armor, they were redesignated heavy cruisers on July 1, 1931 because of their 8-inch guns in compliance with the terms of the first London Naval Treaty. If the Omahas, with their casemated guns and four stacks, were the last of the old, then the Pensacolas were the first of the new. They were the first major U.S. warships built from the start in compliance with the Washington Treaty. Two ships were built. Pensacola was laid down October 27, 1926, and commissioned February 6, 1930. Salt Lake City was laid down almost a year later on June 9, 1927, but still commissioned three months earlier than her sister on December 11, 1929. Every effort was made to keep these ships under 10,000 tons in compliance with the treaty while still giving them the heaviest armament allowable. Extensive welding was used to replace rivets, and armor protection was light. In the end, the ships actually came out almost 1,000 tons underweight. This was to be a problem common to everyone for a while. You have to remember, weighing a ship before it's built wasn't an exact science. Sure, designers more or less knew the weight of all the parts, but until you actually get them together, it's an educated guess. As a result, the ships came out top-heavy with a tendency to roll. As a remedy, they were given bulges to increase their width to height ratio. By the end of the war, they were overloaded and had little margins for growth. Both survived the war, were decommissioned in the post-war drawdown, and were used as targets at the July 1946 bikini bomb testing. Still, they were good ships. Fast, well-armed, and despite their thin armor, both survived being badly mulled. For propulsion, eight boilers, again on the unit principle, provided 107,000 horsepower to four shafts, driving the ship up to 33 knots. As stated above, protection was their weak point. Side armor was a maximum of four inches. Deck armor peaked at one and three quarters inches. Turret armor reached up to two and a half inches. And barbette armor which protects the gun's volatile magazines, was a mere one and a quarter inches. Again, these ships were originally called light cruisers because of their thin protection. Armament was pretty impressive for their size at the time. They carried 10 8-inch, 55 caliber guns in two twin and two triple turrets. All four turrets were on the center line, two forward, and two behind the superstructure. As you'll note from the picture, these turrets were placed with the triples shooting over the twins, called superfiring. You'd think it would make more sense from a stability point of view to put the heavier triples under the twins, but where they would be lower. Normally, that'd be the case except the designers were trying to keep the maximum number of guns dry in heavy seas. It also allowed the wider triple turrets to be moved away from the ends of the ship where the hull narrows as it comes together. Secondary armament was the then new 5 inch 25 caliber gun. Four were carried amidship in single open mounts with two on either side. An impressive gun for the time its good training and elevation speed, complemented by a respectable rate of fire, made it not only a formidable heavy anti-aircraft gun, but also a decent anti-surface gun. It would continue to be the standard heavy AA gun on large ships until finally replaced by the legendary 5-inch 38. Originally fitted with two sets of triple torpedo tubes, 
These would be removed before World War II. Finally, these ships were fitted with two midship catapults to launch four float planes. Unfortunately, there was no hangar, so any work on these planes had to be done out in the open. Throughout the war, radar, light, and medium anti-aircraft guns would be updated, but being so badly needed in service during the first year of the war, they received no major updates. Somewhat ironically, once they could be spared because the newer and better ships were starting to arrive, they were no longer worth the effort of updating. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Pensacola was escorting a convoy of ships to the Philippines. The convoy was rerouted to Australia. Returning to Pearl, she would serve as an escort at the Battle of Midway. She would then go on to cover the carrier Enterprise, missing the first and second naval battles of Guadalcanal on November 13th through 15th. Her chance to fight finally came at the overnight Battle of Tassafurunga on November 29th, 30th, 1942. While maneuvering to avoid collision, she was hit by one of Japan's famous oxygen-powered 24-inch Type 93 Long Lance torpedoes. The damage was severe, and she would be out of action until well into 1943. She would spend the rest of the war escorting carriers and providing shore bombardment. Her sister ship, Salt Lake City, was returning from Wake Island with the carrier Enterprise on December 7th. She would continue to cover that carrier through the Doolittle Raid. Being left behind as a backup during the Battle of Midway, she would again see action around Guadalcanal. At the overnight Battle of Cape Esperance, she would help rout the enemy, receiving three large caliber hits herself. In March 1943, she took part in the Battle of Komondorsky Island. The battle was a result of American efforts to cut Japanese supply lines to their troops stationed in Alaskan waters. Hit several times by Japanese 8-inch shells, she was in mortal danger until the Japanese suddenly retreated, not realizing the Americans were on the very edge of defeat. Having been repaired, she returned to service, escorting the carriers and providing fire support throughout the rest of the war.